Okay, I'm just gonna sit sit down there and relax. So many other, it's almost a full house. Wow. Better catch you soon. A lot of people filling the room. Thank you for coming tonight. It's nice to see that Ricky has friends. <laughs> uh, we, we laid a bet. Does he have friends? Does he not have friends? I lost the bet. Okay, um, so thanks for coming tonight. Uh, really uh, fun to have a Rick's Movies here. Uh, my name is Darren Owing. I'm the Education Director here at the Chinese Culture Center. Uh, our mission is to, what's our mission? We elevate, uh, elevate uh, low-income communities and be a voice for equality. And uh, the, uh, the, um, what we're really appreciated about the films, the things, the work that Rick is doing is sort of unearthing these stories from the past that a lot of people have forgotten. Uh, but what's amazing about tonight's movie is sort of unearthing these sort of uh, heroic stories that I think is really important for all of us to know about. And I'm so glad that Rick uh, left behind the sports casted thing and has become a leading Asian American and not a proper filmmaker. Yeah. When I first started um, doing this, I'm like, what's going on? It's pretty good stuff he's made. So, um, if I, you know, I'm sure you're very proud, like, wow, Darren thinks my stuff is okay, I made it. But, okay, all right. Uh, so, before we get into Rick's stuff, uh, I wanted to invite you to. Uh, bunch of other activities that the Culture Center is doing. First, um, you have to come to this one because I'm the one putting it together, so please, <laughs> please come to this. This is uh, Dancing on Waverly on Saturday. We're going to have a block of Waverly closed on a Saturday between 12 and 4. Uh, we've got uh, Chinese opera, Chinese pop songs, but also rap, Indian, uh, classical dancing, belly dancing. That is the very end, just to make people stay the whole time, you know? Um, and, uh, Oh, and then we have the uh, Chinese Folk Dance Association, so come out to this, it's all free. Uh, then, uh, oh gosh, another thing I'm doing at the end of the month, June 2nd and 3rd, we're doing a trip, we're taking a trip up to Weaverville. And so we have a few chairs left, few seats left. Uh, there's a beautiful, uh, it's actually a pretty gorgeous uh, temple up there. Uh, they've got a great museum with some of the uh, um, weapons that the uh, Chinese miners used to use to defend themselves. And uh, there's a few people up there uh, descended from some of the early miners who wrote some great stories about uh, how Chinese survived up in Weaverville. So Weaverville's probably one of the most remote, um, you know, Chinese settlements in California, so it's, it's good to see. So that's June 2nd and 3rd, and uh, you can, uh, well, you know, contact the Culture Center and we'll put you on the bus. It does cost money, though. Uh, oh, uh, and right next door to the gallery, we have our 10-year retrospective, Shen Rei. So for 10 years, we've been highlighting uh, um, amazing uh, Chinese-American or Chinese artists who were kind of under-recognized and uh, helping them to create new art. And I really encourage you to come by. There's some very, very thoughtful pieces there uh, that you should come see. And finally, oh, up at 41 Ross, we have a little gallery in the same alley where the fortune cookie factory is. And I'll put this very mysteriously to you. Come visit the birth of a new goddess. Okay, I'm serious about that. We have a new goddess that's been born out of there. She's born out of the wishes of women in Chinatown. So come see that. That's open Thursdays through Sundays, 10 to 4. Okay, so finally, um, let's introduce Rick. I think most of you already know him. But, uh, oh, oh, wait. I know you want to come out here. But I forgot to recognize. I wanted to say, uh, Wailing, wave your hand. Where, where'd you go? Wailing's out there. Hi, Wailing. And Tatwina's over there. So those, they are board members, past board members, basically the energy behind the Culture Center being here. Richard over here has a little something to do with it, too. Let's see. Hello, Richard. Okay, great. And then also Stephen Chun over here. Hey, Stephen, thanks for coming here today. And so finally, okay, Rick, here's the official thing. He's a, how many Emmy Awards has he won? Does anyone know how many Emmy Awards he won? You don't know? I thought you were his friends. Two. I heard two. Well, they do know. They are your friends. Okay. So, uh, he's won two Emmy Awards. And uh, he's been doing this stuff for at least over 30 years. 
and he opened Rick Quad Productions. He named it after himself. Okay, Rick Quad Productions in 2008, and making these great movies, doing lots of things like uh, for Ronald McDonald, House Charities, uh, Christy Yamaguchi's Always Dream Foundation, and the award-winning Dancing Through Life, the Dorothy Coy Story, which um, is a pretty fantastic movie, so thanks. Um, and he's also the MC for our gala, the Culture Center's gala in October. Is it in October? Yes, it is in October. So, um, so just for that reason alone, just to see him be the MC, you should come to our gala. So anyway, Rick, why don't you come on up here and let's get your movie started. Thank you, Darren. I appreciate that. And thank you so much for coming out today. I think we have a really interesting show. And I think each uh, documentary appeals to a different group and has a different type of theme to it. So it's kind of a wide range of uh, ideas that are going to be presented today. Um, of course, uh, well, let me ask you this. Who, who's here for Al Young? Who's here for Al Young? Yeah. A lot of friends and relatives. And, and Al and Joe? Um, they're about even, about even half and half. Um, we're, we're very fortunate tonight to have uh, Mr. Young. Where are you, Al? Al Young. There he is. Stand up. Would you, Al Young, in the house tonight? In the flesh. <laughs> we'll, be taking, uh, we'll be signing autographs. Thank you, photos <laughs> And uh, as you might know, Alan Joe passed away last month, uh, early oh, last month. But we are very fortunate tonight to have his widow and his daughter. Annie, where are you? Stand up here. Annie, this is uh, Alan and, and Donna. We are representing the Joe family tonight. For coming. I drove them, my friend, so I <laughs> A couple other people I just want to recognize. Well, also, Connie Young Yu. Where are you, Connie? Con Connie, stand up. Everybody knows Connie. <laughs> Connie will also be here in the documentary as well. Thank you for your help and, and uh, your entire family for helping fund this project. I really appreciate that. Um, some other people I'd like to recognize real quick. Uh, other filmmakers we have in the house. Jeff Adachi. Jeff. Jeff. Besides being the San Francisco wonderful filmmaker. Sounding board for me when I was making uh, Dancing Through Life, the Dorothy Toy Story. I had some ideas past him to see uh, what he thought of it. I appreciate that. And uh, Felicia Lowe, most people know Felicia. Felicia, she has had many documentaries uh, in the past. And uh, who else do we have here? And Ed Moy, where Ed, are you at, Ed? Stand. Just to explain, I would not have done the Al Young story without Ed Moy. <laughs> Ed Moy had started it, and he couldn't finish it, so he asked me if I might be interested in picking it up. And by coincidence, I was going up to Seattle the next weekend, and I called up uh, Al, and we hit it off, and it turned out pretty well. So thank, thanks for the tip and helping with that. Okay. And also, uh, let's see, real quick, Henry Fabusevich. We'll recognize Henry, stand up. Henry was a cameraman for the Al Young story. So, okay, what we'll do is we'll show the Al Young story first, and then we'll do a question and answer session. And then after that, then we'll play the Al and Joe story and have another quick uh, question and answer session after that. So, all right. Okay, please enjoy Race the Al Young Story. This is Quan Fest tonight, okay? <laughs> so we're going to have a few uh, questions from the audience, hopefully. And uh, Al, why don't you come on up here and join me on the front, too. Yeah. Al Young? I didn't recognize him with a coat and tie on him. That was just fancy. Um, would you like to say anything about <laughs> I, I'm just thrilled. I, I shouldn't do this. I told my wife that I'd take a picture of <laughs> Thank you, folks. <laughs> Thank you for indulging me. Okay. Uh, this this film, I, I think, uh, uh, is special to me because it, it also talks about uh, some of the things that I that challenged me that that a lot of uh, Asian Americans don't talk about because if you, there's so much pressure put on Asian Americans to do well in school. And, you know, and I know why, and, and I pressure my children <laughs> to do well, but, but if there's a problem 
um, all hell breaks loose. You know, I mean, uh, I went from um, the part that I didn't talk about was when I was in elementary school where reading wasn't that important. I was building a lot of things, and then uh, they uh, saw some of the things that I was building and uh, sent me to Lux Lab, which was a school for gifted kids. You know, so I had that gifted kids experience in elementary school. But then when I went to junior high, to Presidio Junior High, everything was done by books. And, and of course, you know, I, I just crashed. You know, and, and I could start reading a sentence, and by the time I got to the end, I forgot how it started. You know, so it, and, and I would be sitting with a book for an hour, just struggling, try, trying to do that same page over and over again. And um, I know it wasn't stupid, but uh, it ended up, I started in the top group in the seventh grade at Presidio, and by the time I got to the ninth, I was in the bottom group. And by the time I went to George Washington, I was put in a mentally retarded group. <laughs> You know, and uh, I mean, they had no special ed, you know, so I was in there with, I mean, there were some people that were really, yeah, some serious problems, but I was there with them, you know, so I, I understand the educational system and the challenges that people go through, and this was one of them. Um, so, and the other thing is that uh, I want to say is, it's interesting, I'm going to let people ask questions, but, but, but I, I, I thought I'd, I'd, I'd do one thing is that, you know, uh, a lot of people say, well, why aren't there more Asians in sports? Why aren't there more Asians in acting? And, and you know, it's uh, partially because of the pressures that we have to succeed in the academic world, which we've been very, uh, that are avenues that are open to us. But, you know, I think now's the time to, to start spreading out. I think that the doors are opening. I especially enjoy about this documentary is the uh, angle of the attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Because uh, you were telling me that you showed it to some students, yeah, right? Absolutely. Tell me about that experience oh. you were sharing. Okay, yeah, I took it to a, um, a uh, high school and I took it to three different classes, showed it because one of the teachers asked me to do it. And they, there was kids coming up to me and crying. I said, well, that, I've never thought, you know, I, I just always, you know, had to live with this by myself. And I've never thought that, and I always felt that I was, there was something really wrong with me because I started believing them, even though deep inside I knew I wasn't stupid. You know, so I think these are really important. Um, one funny thing about Al, well, he's a great driver. He has trouble backing up out of the driveway. <laughs> Honestly, he can't back up worth a lick, right? <laughs> Anyway, okay, let's have a couple of quick questions before we go to the next uh, documentary. Darren, are you around? Do you have a microphone? For, where did Darren go? Is that the only one we have? Okay. Oh, I can, I can speak loud. I can, I can speak loud as I can. I'm... I was in the inclusion program, for, and my, I have some of my friends that were in a transition program after high school, and what a what a what an interesting era that you came from, where there's no such thing as special ed at the time. <laughs> yeah. Steve, <laughs> yeah. Do it! <laughs> it's very endearing and celebratory of your success, but you, uh, Rick Austin slightly touched on some of the drivers saying you were the only Asian American on the track. Yeah. Uh, you kind of joked about how they don't know you necessarily by your face, but your name and Bartle. Any, uh, not a horror story, but any unfortunate uh, experiences being Asian on the track and all your years of uh, racial situations? Exactly, yeah. No, not on the track. You know, maybe at a tavern afterwards. You know, we'd be all celebrating and all night. You know, but but well, my friends would, would be made sure that nothing would happen. You know, because sometimes I go in some really redneck bars and, and uh, you know we're, we're all rednecks anyway. You know, because we're all racist. You know, so we just kind of out redneck them. <laughs> yes. Al, you want to tell us about your recent uh, racing? What oh. results you've been getting? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I, I, uh, I last week uh, I, I entered uh, my car, and this is unusual. Most people just enter one event with their car. 
but I, I, I qualified for two events. For, there's, three, there's three categories. There's a sportsman, a pro, and super pro, and I, ordered, I entered both sportsman and pro. And, got, uh, and there was 64 cars in pro, and there was 32 cars in sportsman, and I got second place in pro, and I got second place in sportsman. <laughs> yeah, I, and it, I, it was a total of about 90 people. Kind of yeah. That's great. In, in both categories. Yes. Mr. Young? Yeah. <laughs> Were you born in this area? Or I, I was born in Whittier, California. I came up and lived on the avenues when I was four years old. Oh, no, you're talking about Washington High School. Yeah, 37th Avenue in Balboa. Yeah. And then another thing is, have you ever witnessed any kind of uh, other people's accidents? Oh, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And, and people ask me, he goes, have you been, uh, Fred Brown, the, the famous basketball player, asked me this. And he goes, have, have you been in an accident? I go, no. And he goes, why not? Because, just like you. Uh, and he goes, what, what do you mean, just like you? I, go, I only go 80%, you know, until maybe the final rounds, and, you know, it's a championship event, and I'll go 100. But if you, only, if you go 100% all the time, you're going you're gonna to hurt something. You're going to blow up your car. You, you, you're gonna, something's going to happen. And if you, as a professional basketball player, go 100%, you'll never make it through the season. <laughs> yes. Yes. Very fascinating story. Um, I was born in the Ridge, grew up in Richmond, Alley Avenue is also, and I went to pursue George Washington High School. And that's really fascinating um, with your life when you were young that your family um, moved up to Seattle. What made you for the move, and how was that for you from like, leaving the Bay Area? That, that was a really good point. I thought the reason why I couldn't read was because I was hanging around the kids that I hung around in high school, you know. And when, when you're put in a classroom with, with kids that are, are barely making it through high school, you're, you're dealing with people that are not really high academic. So I figured if I left, you know, that peer group, and, and so I went to a community college in Longview, Washington. I was the only Chinese in the whole place, you know, the whole city. And I locked myself in an apartment and, and was determined to learn how to read. And by accident, I did. <laughs> yes. Hi, uh, oh, hi Susie. <laughs> um, what area are you more proud of? Um, something you did in your teaching career or in racing? Oh, you know, definitely in the teaching you know, uh, but that's, there's so much that goes on in teaching. You know, there's always events that happen in, in racing where it's concentrated and, and you just feel joyous and, and you know, you, you're euphoric about winning. Uh, but uh, teaching is enriching throughout the whole 38 years of teaching. It's wonderful. <laughs> you know? Okay, maybe just one more question. Yeah, no. I, I know, uh, Al, that you've got another side to you. You're very socially active, uh, have been since you were in college. I was wondering if you can uh, maybe speak to that a little bit. So uh, another side of you, social your, your social activism. Oh, social activism, yes. <laughs> you know, it, it's, uh, it, it was all because of Connie. My, my sister Connie, she was so active in the peace movement. You know, people would come back and it was, oh, we're just at the, you know, uh, the polo fields, and, and, and Connie was speaking, and there was some other speaker, Jane Fonda or somebody. You know, <laughs> oh my God! So I really, uh, she she really influenced me. You know, we come from a military family. My father's full colonel. You know, and we, uh, but we were always taught that uh, um, to follow our hearts. And uh, to do what was right, and we felt that the, the war in Vietnam was, was wrong, and uh, that really uh, stimulated us to, or stimulated me to be active, sub, you know, in, in social issues. But the, the anti-war movement started, <laughs> and we were the first. Oh, one more day, <laughs> we we're the first group to ever take the I-5. You know, and the, the I-5 was never taken over until we marched on I-5 and stopped traffic. And so. Southbound traffic on I-5 lanes from the University of Washington to the Roanoke exit. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you very much, uh, We just got some good news, too, by the way. We, um, I just found out literally half an hour ago that the Al Young story was um, accepted at the uh, Sacramento Asian Pacific Film Festival. Yeah. Okay, so we're ready for our next uh, documentary. This is uh, No Ordinary Joe, uh, the Alan Joe story. So we'll, again, we'll do Q&A after this one as well. All right, enjoy.
Q&A, why don't we have uh, Jeff Chen, who is here. Uh, Bruce, where, where are you, Jeff? Here. Oh, there you are. <laughs> Annie, you want to come up here, too? You up for it? Annie? You want to come up here? Oh, no, no. No, you don't? <laughs> Annie will soon turn uh, 95 very soon. So, anyway. Um, but do you, do you have any comments, Jeff? Why don't you? Well, um, I've known Alan for uh, 22 years. Uh, actually, the first time I ever met him is when he came over to my house with uh, Linda. And uh, even though uh, Alan knew Bruce Lee, uh, he was very down to earth. He was one of the nicest guys that I ever met. And, uh, and I really miss him. Um, just to mention about my association with Bruce Lee, uh, I've been collecting since I was uh, 11 years old, um, back in 1972. And um, my goal at the time was to have the biggest Bruce Lee collection in my junior high school, which was Presidio. <laughs> but uh, I guess when all my friends uh, grew up and stopped collecting, I, I continued. Being a good friend of Alan's, um, just tell me the we kind of touched on it, but the impact Alan had on Bruce's life, from your perspective. Um, I don't know if you guys know this, but um, after Bruce was born in San Francisco, Chinatown, on Jackson Street at the Chinese Hospital, um, he only lived here for uh, three months because um, he had to move back to Hong Kong. Back in those days, in order to reclaim your U.S. citizenship, you have to come back when you're uh, 18. So when um, Bruce moved back to San Francisco in 1959, um, once again, he only stayed around um, three months. Um, but when he arrived in San Francisco, there was something that really um, made him feel depressed. He was drafted by the war, and um, he was really worried because he wanted uh, to go to college and have a future in, in America. Um, believe it or not, Bruce failed his physical. <laughs> he was uh, considered a 4F. And um, I think um, some of the reasons were um, he was as blind as a bat. Um, one leg was about an inch shorter than the other. Um, he also had a nasal problem, and I guess uh, the final straw was he was Chinese, so he probably just said, okay, next. <laughs> so when he went to Seattle and um, he uh, was practicing his uh, Kung Fu and he uh, taught and everything, um, he didn't really uh, rely on his, his body, he just relied on the Chinese Kung Fu to uh, protect himself and to teach. So when Alan met him, you know, you, even though um, Bruce was so good in Kung Fu, his, uh, his physique was very skinny. So when he um, saw Alan and uh, James working out, he kind of felt, um, you know, like odd man out. So he would go home and do push-ups and stuff like that. And um, Alice, Alan started to notice Bruce's body and say, wow, you've been exercising? And, Bruce would just kind of keep it a secret, but when Alan bought him his first weights bet, that's when he started to, to build his body. And um, when you see Bruce's movies, he's like a walking Grey's Anatomy chart. <laughs> and um, you would, back in the 70s, you would mostly see Bruce in Chinese martial arts magazines. But um, back in the 1990s, he started to be on the cover of Muscle and Fitness and Flex magazine and all these bodybuilding magazines. So that's, um, that was pretty incredible. But um, like I said in the documentary, it's probably all due to Alan's inspiration. Uh, basically how I came to do this documentary on Alan, we had met when um, Bruce had his star put on the wall of fame in Hollywood. Uh, my TV station actually sent me down there. At the time it coincided with the release of that movie, Dragon, the Bruce Lee story. And uh, since Bruce was born in San Francisco, as you mentioned, I tried to make it a localized type story that way. 
Anyway, I, that's when I originally met Alan. That was back in the 90s, I guess, early 90s, something like that. And then uh, we re reconnected again about two or three years ago uh, when the book on his life, the, four Mus the last of the Four Musketeers, came out. And I met the author, and Alan was at that book signing, and uh, just kind of re became reacquainted. And after I read the book, I just really felt like Alan deserved more recognition uh, in, in shaping the career of an icon like Bruce Lee. So, anyway. Okay, let's have some questions. Yes, Steve. What kind of uh, gym rat was Alan in, in the gym? Uh, was he really quiet, uh, talkative, social, um, very focused, uh, boot camp style? But you weren't around when he was working with those guys, the uh, Lane and them. Uh, but he would kind of share with me uh, oh, okay. stories about okay. him uh, working out. Um, I guess it's uh, the way he was raised, that he was very uh, humble, and he wouldn't be the type that would um, show off like some of these guys in, in the gym always going like, <coughs> <coughs> <laughs> um, but he, um, he, he really focused on his body, and um, I, I asked him, um, did, did Bruce Lee ask you some tips too on how to uh, work out or bodybuild? And uh, he told me that uh, Bruce Lee became a fanatic about his abs, his lats, and his forearms. And Bruce was like a forearm fanatic. And uh, when you see him posing, he would, uh, you know, pose in his usual, you know, like, <laughs> like a cobra. And, um, but just to squeeze his um, forearms was not enough for Bruce. He asked Alan, can you give me more tips? So Alan told him, okay, you uh, squeeze your forearm, but if you press your thumb down here, it'll blow up the forearm a little bit more. So, <laughs> yeah, Steve's a bodybuilder too, right? So <laughs> he can probably show us a few things too. <laughs> Other questions about the Alan Jones story? Donna, you're here. Donna is uh, Alan's daughter. Is there anything you wanted to include about your dad? You did really good on this. Um, his store was actually in Oakland. Okay. Okay, it was on East 14th Street. And he did when Mr. Northern California, I don't know if that was in there, but he was. Yeah, that, that was. He, okay, he was Mr. Northern California. Right. First Asian uh, that won Mr. Northern California bodybuilding. Yes. In 1946. So anyway, I wasn't sure. I yeah, that, that was mentioned. Okay, it was 1946. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
distinction of being the only person to have never spoken to him about his friend Bruce. Yeah, um, we would we would sit and we would talk at breakfast about the two yes, things that were. I'm sorry, my name is Carl. I've been I've been having lunch and breakfast with Uncle Alan since 2012, um, and I, I have I think the distinct or the distinction of being the only person who have never spoken to him about his friend Bruce. We would sit and we would talk about the two things that were most important to him, and that was his family and fitness. And um, we as a group, we're, we're so grateful that this has been put together. Thank you. Thank you. All right, maybe a couple more questions and then we'll wrap it up. Anything else in the back? Al's talking about that, trying to especially get it into the education system. We, in fact, we had a conversation on the phone about that today. So, uh, yeah, that is something we would like to do. I think especially with the ADHD. Yes. Anything else? I hope that won't take too long, because I work in a school system, and oh. we can use it right okay. now. There you go. <laughs> you can buy a copy and uh, take it. <laughs> Any, anything from this side? Yeah. Yeah, are you... Uh, Going to continue making these kind of profile kind of documentaries on these people, these interesting people? Probably. These just, or they just run into them? It's really, like I said, uh, I did Alan Young because of Ed Moy, and uh, Alan was because I went to his book signing and became kind of fascinated by you know, needing to do that. Um, right now, actually, I'm currently working on a documentary on Mary Etley, so that's going to take up most of my time in the next six months or so. But... Uh, but yeah, I, I enjoy doing these type of things, so no problem. Anything else? Okay. Uh, oh, um, I cannot imagine well, what Bruce Lee looked like after hearing a story about Alan Joe because I first heard of him was I was watching uh, what was it? it was a Chinese cartoon movie, uh, Lo Fuji. It means old master Q, where there was a a Bruce Lee trivia. He was he was muscular. Yeah. yeah, I can't imagine how he would look like without him. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, so we're going to wrap it up. Uh, again, we'll be selling uh, DVDs on the side, 20 bucks each. Uh, uh, Al has also brought some of his model replica cars that he's more than happy to autograph for you. And we're going for $20 a piece on those two. So, okay. All right. Oh, wait, one more. Recently, I saw a, a cooking show, and it had to do with uh, food in Hong Kong. And all these patrons were busy uh, talking about food, but then also they were talking about Bruce Lee. So they're still very, very, uh, Bruce is still very, very popular with all these younger people in Hong Kong. Okay, you, yeah, Bruce is... You have, you have a market there. Yeah, yeah, he's so legendary. I mean, he died in 73, but his influence is still being felt today. All right. All right. Again, thank you for coming. Hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. Yeah, look at so many of them. Wow. That's four. I would say it's a uh, two-thirds stick. I was, they are all gathered around the place. Like, wow. Oh, he's nuts. Somebody's flashing out cameras. All right, then. Whoa. Yeah. Okay. I might pick it up or I might not get it, but I'll say I enjoyed it. So. It's an 11. This is great. Yeah. I know. Um, Larry. 
Okay. Yeah. Um, just my short nickname. I'm almost half surprised your father was involved in World War II. Yes. Oh, yes. He was in CBI, China, Burma, India. He was a reserve officer. Oh. He was a businessman. He did other things. He made soy sauce. Wow. He was in the military before World War II started. <laughs> so he was one of the first to go. Really? And, yes. And this should, you should go out to the Larry Elser. And this uh, is it Lawrence. <laughs> okay, I'll do Lawrence. Did he send that? Yeah. Okay, good. Let me take a picture. Can we take a picture?